everybody here this morning. As you can see, I'm a, a little moving a little slow today. I thank you for your prayers. Uh, Humpty Dumpty took a great fall on Monday, <laughs> but the Lord is slowly putting him back together again. And so uh, earlier this week, as I knew I wasn't going to be able to prepare like a, I want to be able to prepare, I, I never want to just wing it. Uh, I, hope, I hope that you never want me to just wing it either. And so uh, I got on the phone and I called my my old pal, Kevin Bowles, known him for about 20 years off and on, mm -hmm. he, uh, from, from back at Dutchtown. He, he, he worked with the uh, LBC, the, the Youth Evangelist Strategist, I guess you call it now. Close enough. Yeah, 20, 20 years he did that, and then uh, did some other stuff in between. And he served the last five years at First Baptist Pineville Lead in Washington. They've done a fantastic job. I didn't even know he could sing, <laughs> much less lead it, but that's in his wheelhouse. He did a fantastic job. And now he's uh, God's moved him again, and now he's now I think he's really settled into it where he'll do a great job. He's doing chaplaincy work with uh, uh, the hospice care uh, facility and stuff like that. Amen. So anyway, uh, Kevin, come on up here and share what God's laid on your heart this morning, brother. Thank you, brother Mike. Well, good morning. Good morning. I know sometimes uh, when your pastor's out, and it's a it's okay when your pastor's out, especially when he's hurt. Sometimes you have these great expectations that he's going to bring in somebody like, you know, you thought you were going to get Andy Griffith, but you got Barney Fife. And uh, so here I am. But I'm just delighted to serve here today and just to share with you uh, from the truth of God's Word. And it's just a real blessing to be here. I'm thankful to have my wife with me. Uh, my wife, Judy, is here with me. And we are empty nesters, so that means we can do, go do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it. And uh, so I'm just thankful that she's able to travel with me wherever we go. She is the apple of my eye. She is my prime rib. And uh, she is the mother of our three kids, uh, two of whom are married. And we have three grandchildren and two foster grandchildren. Amen. And uh, they live everywhere from Abilene, Texas, through Jackson, Mississippi, all the way out to Roswell, Georgia. So we, uh, we keep Interstate 20 burned up. And uh, so just thankful for the opportunity to uh, have her with me always and to have her support and so just grateful for that. Those of you that have been married for longer than 30 years, you know what that's like. Amen? Amen. And uh, just grateful for that. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the Old Testament book of Nahum? The Old Testament book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 7 here in just a minute. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. I'm grateful to be with you today. As, as Mike said, he called me earlier this week and uh, was moaning and groaning and complaining, and, and I'm just grateful to uh, be able to share. I love Mike to death. Uh, for the main reason, we have similar tastes and hairstyles, and uh, we see eye to eye on a number of things. So I'm grateful that uh, he is your pastor and you are being led well. And so thank you for the opportunity to stay in the gap room today. <clears throat> One of the cars I remember my parents owning when I was growing up was a 1966 Mercury Colony Park Station Wagon. It was blue, uh, wood grain panels down the side, 390 cubic inch V8 under the hood, tuck and roll vinyl seats, and the coolest thing was the side facing folding rear jump seats. Can I get a witness? Anybody remember? <laughs> My twin brother Keith, there is another one of me in this world. Uh, his name is Keith, he's about a head taller, about 25 pounds lighter. Uh, he's ugly as a mud fence. I got the looks, he got the brains. He's a doctor. My twin brother Keith and I loved to play in this car. And this was before the days of locking ignitions and locking transmissions. Nothing locked up back then. And so we would roll the windows down and play in the car. We would play car in that station wagon. And my brother was always the driver because he could make the better car noise than I could as you're driving along. And on one particular beautiful summer day, my brother was driving, and our driveway was a slight incline. My brother was driving when he grabbed the column gear shift and said these immortal words. I wonder what this does. <laughs> and he pulled the gear shift down and dropped it right into neutral. Well, the car began to roll down the driveway. So my brother and I do the smartest thing we've ever done. We opened the doors and we got out. We watched that car roll down the driveway. 
we watched it roll across the street, and we watched it roll into our neighbor's front yard, headed straight for their bay window, and it was destined to be the centerpiece on their kitchen table for dinner that night, until one of the front tires hit the water meter indention in the front yard and turned the car. And what followed was the most perfect example of parallel parking you have ever seen. When the car parked itself in my neighbor's front flower bed. My brother and I have watched this entire episode from the top of our driveway. And I distinctly remember my brother and I looking at each other and saying, That was awesome! <laughs> my mom called my dad home from work that day. It is never a good day when your dad gets called home from work. And my brother and I were in really big trouble. If you look at the world around us, sometimes it looks like there is nothing but despair. Hopelessness and trouble. We've got chaos in Washington in what appears to be one of the most corrupt presidents in history. We've got wildfires in places, of all places, Hawaii. With the stock market that goes crazy. It's never very consistent. Gas prices that seem to be rising again. My gauge is Walmart. Walmart always has the cheapest gas. And I drive by it when I go home and I just gauge it. Well, they're going up again. This LGBTQ movement that's taking over everything. And it begs the question, where is God in all this? Where is God in all this? It even begs the question for you and I personally in our own faith. How strong is my faith in God? How big is my hope in Jesus? Will I trust God even though it seems that the wicked control our world? We all have trouble. Or we all go through trouble at some point in time in our lives. Amen? Amen. So today, I, I just want to encourage you that we're not stuck. God is still on His throne. That's right. He is alive, and He is at work. And even as far back as the Old Testament, the book of Nahum, God was at work. You're not encased in concrete. Your life is not a dead end. That's right. And the possibility of change in our world through the people of God has not slipped through our fingers. Change is possible for you and me, even in the places where change seems most helpless. This is the time of year if you are on Facebook or anything, any kind of social media, you see people taking their freshmen to college and moving them into the dorm. And you, you see uh, seniors painting their parking spot at the high school and things like that. And Judy and I just sit there and we think about two things. Oh, well, that's sweet. And number two, I'm sure glad we're not doing that again. You know? <laughs> but the other thing that comes to mind is, is what are they being taught in their schools today? And how prevalent is the gospel? And I pray for this generation of students that they will be bold enough to take their Bible to school and to share Christ with their campus. Because we live in a wicked, chaotic world. That's right. But God is still good. Right. Change is possible for you and me, even in the places where change seems most helpless. Why? Because the giver of the capital G, the giver of transformative grace, has made you and me the place where he dwells. That's, right. That's where he dwells. That's right. I love the timelessness of God's word. I love the fact that the Bible always speaks relevantly to today. The Bible is a hope story. It is about hope misplaced and hope found. Someone once said, we can live 40 days without food, 8 days without water, 4 minutes without air, but only a few seconds without hope. Follow along with me. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1-7. through seven. A little background before we read. Nahum was an Elkishite. In other words, he was from the city of Elkosh, and it's a city in southern Judah. Nahum prophesied against the city of Nineveh. This is significant for the people of Judah because of the encouragement they needed 
in the face of the terrifying power of the Assyrian Empire. The people were in despair. It sounds a little familiar to me. Nahum preached during the darkest period in Judah's history to that point. It was a time filled with idolatry of all kinds in a nation that had completely turned its back on God. It sounds all too familiar to me. That's right. The people of Judah had to, had to decide if God would have any place in their lives going forward. They had to make that decision. However, the Lord's willingness to send Nahum, who na whose name means comfort, into such a hopeless situation, it gives evidence to God's unrelenting grace. God's unrelenting grace. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. The pronouncement concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is fierce in wrath. The Lord takes vengeance against His foes. He is furious with His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm, and clouds are the dust beneath His feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up, and He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither. Even the flower of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before Him, and the hills melt. The earth trembles at His presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand His indignation? Who can endure His burning anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. Even rocks are shattered before Him. And then verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of distress. The next day after we rolled the car down the street, out of the driveway, my, my brother and I were in our radio flyer red wagon. I was always riding. He would make the better car for us. So we noticed that there was this truck that came down the road that had this turning football on the back of it. We didn't know what it was. It was just really big. Well, we figured out that that was a concrete truck. And a few houses down from where we lived, they were pouring concrete onto a, a new driveway. And they had been working there all day long. And we sat there in that red wagon, and they would take that chute and move that concrete around and take two befores and smooth it out. And they had these white boots on that were just... Pretty cool they could walk in that concrete. And my brother and I just sat there and watched them. And they poured the concrete on this beautiful driveway. And then they did something we didn't expect. They left. And so me and my brother determined, you know what? We need to leave our mark on this driveway. So we got in our little red wagon after it had set up a little bit in that concrete. And we pushed ourselves in that driveway. And left tracks all over that new concrete driveway. And then we thought, people need to know who we are. So we found a stick and we wrote our name, Keith and Kevin, in that driveway. There was no doubt who had caused that kind of trouble. Well, the next morning, the contractor called my parents and told them to go look outside at our little red wagon and see if there was concrete built up on the wheels and if there were little boots with concrete on them. Sure enough, right outside the back door, there was a red wagon with concrete built up on the wheels and boots with concrete. And my parents had to pay for that driveway to be taken up and poured new concrete again. Sometimes trouble never ends, right? Sometimes we find ourselves in trouble and we don't know what we're going to do. Sometimes we see that trouble is all around us. And sometimes we see that chaos is all around us. And we, we, we ask the question, where's the hope? Is this ever going to get better? Where is God? I just want to remind you of three things today that Nahum reminds us of today. Because there is always hope. When it seems our world is filled with evil and despair, and it seems that the people of God are being persecuted from all sides, Nahum gives us three points to remind us. Here's what I want to remind you of today. Number one, God's memory is not erased by the passing of time. God's memory is not erased by the passing of time. The people of Judah had suffered more than a century of cruel Assyrian domination. 
A century is how long? It's a hundred years. More than a hundred years of Assyrian domination. They were forced to worship false gods and submit to excessive demands. To say they were in despair was probably an understatement. Couldn't the same be said for the people of God today? When you look at what's going on in the world around us, it's easy to say we are oppressed as well. And oppression often raises the question, where is God? I love to read Paul David Tripp. Paul David Tripp writes a book that I would encourage you to get called New Morning Mercies. It's 365 one-page devotions. And he's just a, a great writer. And what he, one of the things that Paul David Tripp says about oppression is this. Oppression can incite anger at God and test your patience with His timing. We see that. Oppression can trade faith with discouragement. Oppression makes you decide if hope in God for the future provides sufficient strength to endure the trials of the present. Oppression can do those things. However, Nahum reminds us that God knows what is going on. That's right. Praise the Lord. Amen. God knows. I tell my, my hospice patients all the time, God knows who you are. God does not forget. He knows you and He loves you. And He will not forsake you. That's right. And it's God who will bring justice and vengeance. He has great power and will not leave the guilty unpunished. God's memory is not erased by the passing of time. The second focus point is this. God's might is not eroded by the mischief of men. God's might is not eroded by the mischief of men. Do we have mischievous men in the world around us? Crazy men. Verses 3 through 6. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm and clouds with the dust beneath its feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up, and He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, even the flower of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before Him, and the hills melt. The earth trembles at His presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand His indignation? Who can endure His burning anger? God's mind is not eroded by the mischief of men. We have mischief in our world. We have people that are trying to fool us. We have people that are trying to uh, put their own kinds of educational systems in front of us. Shootings at parades and schools and college campuses. Protests over the very issue of life. Right. Pride Month and its overwhelming message and desire to confuse. A government that seems to want to control every aspect of our lives. Right. We live in a mischievous culture. But I'm reminded of the words of the great hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God has willed His truth to triumph through us. The Lord is great in power. Though He may prolong His mercy, His omnipotence remains. The Greek word for power here is, is koa, which suggests the ability to endure or the capacity to produce. And from there comes the idea of the ability to cope with situations. How many of you have grandchildren? You know what the understanding of coping with things are. <laughs> Our little grandson Leland is five, about to be six, and he is every bit of little boy. And he is in that stage where everything is a competition with his older sister. And so when Judy and I have the opportunity to be with them, sometimes we just have to learn how to cope. Amen? <laughs> sometimes we have to learn. You know the song, right? God will make a way <laughs> where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a way. God will make a way. So do not fear, beloved. 
God's power and truth will triumph through us. God's might is not eroded by the mischief of men. Number three, God's mercy is not eliminated by the madness of life. God's mercy is not eliminated by the madness of life. Verse 7, The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of distress. God's mercy is not eliminated by the madness of life. I need to, to finish the story about rolling the car down the driveway and destroying a brand new concrete driveway. After all that had happened, and my brother and I had been disciplined by my father, which usually meant a belt coming through the loops, and we were banished to our room. My dad came into our room, and he picked us up, and he carried us to his chair. Every father has a chair. And he rocked us. And he told us how much he loved us. And I will never forget what it's like to rest in the arms of my father. God's mercy is not eliminated by the madness of life. That's right. God's mercy is not eliminated from the madness in your life. God's mercy is not eliminated. God has not forsaken us. He is a stronghold, meaning refuge, a strong fortified place. Proverbs 18.10 His name is a strong tower. He cares for us. That's an intimate relationship. The Lord is good. And it will always be our refuge. Even though it seems that there's chaos and trouble around us. And even though when we go home and we turn the news on today and we're going to see even more chaos and trouble, don't be surprised by that. That's right. Because the Lord reminded us that in this world we will have trouble. Right. And I just came to learn that my parents were not surprised at the more trouble that me and my brother got into. Even after rolling the car down the driveway and destroying the concrete driveway, you ground two little boys in their room. We're going to find something to do. Amen? <laughs> so we're two twin boys, two twin beds, and there's drapes in our bedroom. The drapes are open. <clears throat> and my brother and I decided we needed to have a little fun, so my brother begins to Tarzan up one side of the drapes. And he climbs up there and he's hanging on, and he turns around to me and he says, Hey, push me. So I begin to push him. And he begins to swing back and forth in front of that window. Well, I'm not going to let him have all of the fun. I'm not going to let him do it. So I climb up on the other side of the drape. They're open. And we begin to swing back and forth on those drapes. Just having the most innocent time of our lives. Until we hear the cracking noise. And what happened was, is we began to pull the curtain rod out of the wall. And so that was the cracking. And whoever put that curtain rod up there did a fantastic job. Because not only did we pull the curtain rod out of the wall, we pulled both sheets of 8 by 10 sheetrock off of the wall. And it crashed down on top of us. Crashed down on top of us. And if you've ever worked with drywall, when you drop drywall, it just turns into gray matter. Right? <laughs> So we're laying on our beds and there's this fog in our room from all of that dust. And my mother hears the commotion and she comes into the room and she goes, what is the trouble? Again, what is the trouble? And I remember my brother raising up out of that dust as though he had risen from the dead and just stared up at my mom and just said, nothing, nothing. Three days in a row that one summer, we got in trouble. But as I said to you before, I'll never forget the love of my Father. And even though there is chaos, and even, even though there is trouble around us, the Lord is at work. God has not forsaken us. He is a stronghold. He is our refuge. He desires an intimate relationship for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 reminds us, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, 
but what is unseen is eternal. I'm thankful that our God is an eternal God. That's right. And I'm thankful that He is a good God who will always be our refuge. So would you seek refuge in the Lord today? Would you seek His hope and find hope in Him? And remember, there is no better place to rest than the arms of our Father today. Are you currently experiencing the love of God on a daily basis? Do you know Him intimately? Do you know the love of God truthfully? Jesus showed us that love on the cross. And I'm thankful today that the cross is empty. The tomb is empty and the stone is rolled away. Because Jesus loved us that much. What adjustments do you need to make in your life currently to experience this love? What do you need to do to experience that? What do you need to do today? Join me as we pray together. Father, I'm grateful that you are a God who is not ever caught by surprise. You are never caught off guard. And so, Father, I pray that we've been encouraged today to know that you are on your throne, that you are alive and well, and that you are present in our lives. So, Father, today I pray for these precious people, brothers and sisters in Christ, who will go back to the regular routines of their life, even tomorrow, and face uncertainty in the world, face a world that oftentimes rebukes you, ridicules you, wants nothing to do with you. Father, today I pray for strength. I pray for an endurance that can only be explained by the power of your presence in our lives. Thank you, Father, that you never leave us, that nothing catches you by surprise, that you are a mighty and trustworthy God in whom we can take refuge. I pray, Lord, that we might find comfort in who you are. Father, I know that there are people who are going through periods of chaos. There are, periods who have, there are people who have questions about their life or circumstances that are going on in their life. I'm grateful, Father, that you are a God of peace and that you are a God who has answers. So, Father, today, would you hear our plea for help? And, Father, would you make your kingdom known through your people today? Thank you, Father, that you are good, you are powerful, and you are trustworthy. We thank you, God, for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, would you find yourself in a place where there's some decisions that you might need to make? Maybe there's one of you here today that doesn't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is where this journey begins. Trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe today you're looking for a place to become a stronger disciple of Jesus. There is no greater church than this one. And there is no greater place to do that. Maybe today you just need to come to this altar and pray. Thank the Lord for His goodness and His grace. Maybe today you need to come to this altar and just petition the Lord to do a mighty work in your life. Maybe there's someone that you need to pray for today. You can do that even at where you sit. Maybe today is a day where you come and say to the Lord, Father, take over. Take over today. Our world needs you. And I believe it begins in places like this. I believe that's where it begins. So as we sing, you stand and come before Brother Mike will be here at the front to receive you.